on this week's episode of Vaticano. The Pope speaks of praying in the bad times and the good. This young priest from Panama dedicates his studies and a book to Joseph Ratzinger's thoughts on the liturgy. Movements for the new evangelization take over Rome for the weekend. Men and women of many nations seek new ways to bring the gospel message back to secularized nations, and they all look to the Pope for guidance. All this and a thought towards the coming pilgrimage for peace in Assisi, coming up on Vaticano. Here in St. Peter's Square, Pope Benedict XVI held his weekly general audience for the faithful and pilgrims on October the 12th. It was a chance to return to the series of catechesis he's giving on prayer. Dear brothers and sisters, in our continuing catechesis on Christian prayer, we now turn to Psalm 126. This psalm is a joyful prayer of thanksgiving for God's fidelity to his promises in bringing about Israel's return from the Babylonian exile. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. A similar spirit of joy and thanksgiving should mark our own prayer, as we recall the care which God has shown to us in the events of our lives, even those which seem dark and bitter. Pope Benedict explained more specifically in his Italian address how a person can incorporate this spirit into his prayer. This psalm teaches us that in our prayer we should look more often to how, in the events of our lives, the Lord has protected, guided, and helped us, and praise Him for how much He has done and how much He does for us. We must be more attentive to the good things the Lord gives us. We are always aware of the problems and difficulties, and we are almost unwilling to perceive that there are beautiful things that come from the Lord. This attention, which becomes gratitude, is very important for us, and it creates for us a memory of the good that aids us also in the dark hours. God does great things, and he who experiences them, attentive to the goodness of the Lord with his heart, is filled with joy. As the psalm continues, it uses a metaphor of the harvest to speak of hope. The psalmist implores God to continue to grant Israel his saving help. May those who saw in tears reap with, <coughs> with shouts of joy. The symmetry of the seed which silently grows to maturity reminds us that God's salvation is at, at once a gift, already received, and the object of our hope, a promise whose fulfillment remains in the future. Jesus will use the same imagery to express a passage from death to life, from darkness to light, which must take place in the lives of all who put their faith in him and share in his paschal mystery. As we praise this psalm, we may echo the song of the Virgin Mary by rejoicing in the great things which the Almighty has done for us and by awaiting in hope the fulfillment of God's promises. At the end of the audience, Pope Benedict said that he was deeply saddened by the violence in the streets of Cairo, Egypt, at the beginning of October, and he made a special plea for peace. He then imparted his apostolic blessing. Sit nomen Domini Benedictum. Ex hoc nunc Adiutorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Qui feci celum et terra. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. The thought of Joseph Ratzinger on church liturgy was the point of discussion at this book presentation in Rome on October the 13th. Joseph Ratzinger, otherwise known as Pope Benedict XVI, wrote so much in the subject of liturgy, in fact, that this priest and student has dedicated years to reviewing it for his dissertation. The most astonishing thing, as I studied and wrote about Ratzinger, was seeing that every time in the celebration of the Eucharist that it was a reality. It wasn't just a text, but it was something that he and his brother priests have lived 
and that is something that can really change our lives. All of us have a great necessity of finding unity, of finding love and truth. I was looking for an author that was appropriate to study the liturgy, a subject on the liturgy, and a friend of mine said, why not Ratzinger? I reacted like everyone else. I said, Ratzinger and the liturgy, what do they have in common? The interesting thing is that studying little by little all of his writings and books, I discovered that windows were opened because I saw his entire liturgy, and his whole theology is firmly based in the liturgy. There is no separation between liturgy, Christology, theology, but he has a profound unity in all of his thought which is very liturgical. He thinks of the church as a Eucharistic community. And the young Panamanian priest's work drew the attention of the Pope's appointed authority on liturgical matters. Thank you for coming to the presentation of this book, which is a truly great contribution to the liturgy and also to theological science. It is a very unifying thought. The unity of the thought of Ratzinger is the same as that of Pope Benedict XVI. It must be seen in this perspective. There has been no gap, no change at all. And for this book, the author even had the opportunity to get feedback from the man at the top. Actually, I was with the Holy Father yesterday, and I took him the book. He was impressed by it because he didn't know about it. He held it up in his hand and said, thank you, and God bless you. I was really excited, after all these years of study, to deliver it to him. To see it in his hands was a gift from God. These women are doing their part to bring about the new evangelization. They were at Rome's Regina Apostolorum University on October the 14th to discuss the promotion of its feminine face. Among them was this Carmelite sister who has gone online to revive the faith in her homeland and to find new vocations. The Netherlands had a lot of missionaries. You know, I am not entered in, in this congregation, gave up my whole and, and career as a, as a singer, and I was really good, to, to let it die. Come on, Jesus, where is it? Where shall I find new ones? Where can I find people? Then I was invited with Life Team. Maybe never heard of it? That's an organization who brings the teens closer to Christ and to Holy Mass. And they told that I have to go in bars and football plays. And I think, uh, I don't know, I cannot go there. And I think, where are they? Where did I find them? On the internet. This is one of her sites, though it exists in the Dutch language, to reach out to locals. She also has Facebook and a blog. Through these connections, she receives up to 300 emails per week, mostly from young people. Some questions about their faith or that they, that they don't feel well or they are and, and depressed and they want to know what they have to do or uh, sometimes they are pregnant and they don't know where to go. But also questions, you know, sister, how can I pray better? I, I don't know how to pray. How, how, or how do you pray the, 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 and, and the rosary? Or, you know, I heard about in confession, but how is it working? What, what shall I say? And where can I find somebody? And, and most of the people who write to me, they are not Catholic. The, the Netherlands is a, is a good e example for how, it, how you don't have to work. You, you, you can't work like that, you know. There is no catechism in the Catholic schools. There are no Catholic schools. There are Catholic schools. Uh, you, you can see it on the wall uh, outside, but inside, nothing. So. Uh, a lot of parents didn't baptize their children, so they are not Catholic. I have now two coming in, they were even not baptized. So the whole process of uh, catechism and uh, is this the Catholic faith what you want? Of course I want to, you know, this is the, the big church, I want to get them in, but they have to be free. Baptism. Yeah, and then the confirmation, everything is then in, in one. And then they have to live their faith for so a couple of years before they can enter. And I think all who are now in, nah, they, they, didn't, they weren't Catholic. They were baptized maybe, but that's it. So I was, I was also. I, I'm now looking good, but I, I never went to, to church till, my, till I was 24. So then I found Jesus and then it was very, uh, I started singing and it was a very good study and I, I was 
you know, singing in, in Berlin and in Amsterdam in the big halls. And, and, and then Jesus came and I followed him. And many others are now following her in the same direction. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. In an office just outside the Vatican, these people are working to put answers in reach of those who seek them. They are part of a new online Catholic information service called Aletea. Aletea is the answer to a need that I think everybody could understand very easy. Uh, when you search for a recipe, where do you go? You go through internet. When you search uh, and you want to know when Michelangelo was alive, where do you go? You go to internet. And where, when you are searching for God, questions, when you have questions about God, about your life, about the meaning of your life, where do you go? You go to internet. And what do you find? You find uh, the first questions are always quest answers from a lot of sites, but never a Catholic site. In the first screen, you, you will not find, if you type uh, who is Christ, who is Jesus, you will not find a Catholic site. So we want to give clear, documented answers to questions on faith and life that represent the statement of the church. Some of the most challenging questions will be answered by those who can best do so. So now we are answering questions as, for example, uh, Christ, Christ, true man and true God. You believe it, but how do you explain that? Another question that we are answering now is what Pius XII did for Jewish people? It is a question that for some people is important, they want to understand. And uh, we are presenting an exclusive interview with Navarro Valls, the former ex spokesperson of Jean Paul II, and he will speak on the feast day of Jean, Jean Paul II, the first liturgical feast day. The site has been online since October the 19th, and this is one of the many services that is making the church ever more present in the new media. These are the new evangelists. Crowds of them at the Vatican on October the 15th for the first ever Congress for the cause of new evangelization. They're aiming to re-evangelize areas that have historically been Christian, but that may currently be struggling with widespread secularization. Among them, there was no lack of missionary spirit. These young people were there all the way from Kerala in India. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? And uh, we, we are uh, the members of a movement called Jesus Youth and uh, our uh, only the main motive of our uh, work of our movement is evangelization. As we always say, Jesus Youth is a, uh, is a mo missionary movement at the service of the church. So we really, we are proud to be part of the church. We are proud to be uh, the, the youth of the youth of Jesus Christ. And uh, we have no other motive than to, to, to spread the love of Jesus Christ. Though the majority were European, an astonishing variety of others joined them. Even Egyptian Catholics were represented at the Congress. Uh, it's uh, as if we are being updated with, the, with the, how the world became, how the youth have a new life, new traditions, new style of life. They're all part of a greater movement given impulse by the Pope himself. Given that the focus of the new evangelization is in those countries where the gospel has already been preached uh, in some way and received, but where people have drifted from the gospel and families who were once strong in their faith are no longer so strong, I think the impact of young people of faith in those settings upon families with their neighbors, with their friends, their peers, people they know, is going to be vital. So I think 
that in our, certainly in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, um, I know our own Bishops Conference wants to capture the spirit of the new evangelization, work together with the, the many new groups of young people that are uh, working for the gospel and living their Catholic faith day by day. And uh, there's evidence of that here, I think, this weekend too. Familiar faces were there as the evangelists converged on the Paul VI audience hall. There, 8,000 strong were welcomed by the head of the still young Pontifical Council for the new evangelization. You have all accepted the invitation which has come directly from the Holy Father, to whom I said that one can't carry out a new evangelization if one doesn't have new evangelizers. You are here as a sign and witness that you are the new evangelizers. The joyful crowd were also treated to some testimonies. There is nothing more beautiful and with more authority than the church, and young people know it. Thank you, Jesus Christ, and thank you, Mother Church. We mustn't ever forget that we don't believe in a system of thought, but we believe in a person. Alatea.org was presented, and a highlight came in the form of a mini-concert by opera star Andrea Bocelli. But as ever, the main draw was Pope Benedict XVI. and he left them with a challenge to change the world. Today's world needs people who will announce and give testimony that it is Christ who teaches us the art of living, the path of true happiness, because he is the path of life. It needs people who keep their gaze fixed on Jesus, the Son of God. The word of the proclamation must always be immersed in an intense relationship with him, in an intense prayer life. Today's world needs people who speak to God to then be able to speak of God. And we must also always remember that Jesus did not redeem the world with beautiful words or extraordinary means but with suffering and death. The law of the grain of wheat that dies in the earth is true still today. We cannot give life to others without giving our own. Whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it, says the Lord. Seeing all of you here and knowing the great amount of work each of you puts into service to the mission, I am convinced that the new evangelizers will be multiplied ever more to give life to a true transformation of which today's world is in need. Only through men and women shaped by the presence of God will the word of God continue its path in the world, bringing fruits. Not surprisingly, that message didn't fall on deaf ears. I came to be confirmed in this mandate that the Lord has left us of evangelizing. I count myself satisfied because the Pope told us clearly that we are called to do this. Another thing that struck me was to hear from the academic, the writer, and the religious sister. I liked seeing the passion they have in the search for truth. Yeah, I think it's a very encouraging encounter because it's sort of uh, stamps all our efforts and all our work and, and the church is saying exactly as we are feeling, shall we say, in the battlefield in front of all of evangelization. And we feel supported and encouraged by, by this movement of the church of trying to, to support the people doing this work and to encourage new people to do the work.
And these are the faces of just some of the new evangelists already taking on their task to renew their Christian traditions. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Mass in St. Peter's rounded off a weekend dedicated to the new evangelization in Rome. In this faith-filled atmosphere, Pope Benedict decided to unveil plans for the observation of a special year of celebration in the church. During the homily and the prayer of the Angelus this past weekend, the Holy Father has announced great news for the whole world. After having dedicated his pontificate to the virtues of love and hope, from October 11th, 2012 through November 24th, 2013, we will celebrate a year of faith. October 11th next year, in fact, will mark the 50th anniversary of the opening session of the Second Vatican Council, called by Blessed John XXIII. It will be a moment of grace and commitment for an ever fuller conversion to God, to reinforce our faith in Him and announce Him with joy to the men of our time. The Holy Father, continuing the tradition of the great Second Vatican Council, is inviting all of us to share the great gift of faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, especially with those who do not know Him yet and those who have redu reduced Him to a historical character, among many others. He reserved a final message for those involved in the new evangelization in the world. Dear brothers and sisters, you are among the protagonists of the new evangelization that the Church has taken on and is bringing forward, not without difficulty, but with the same enthusiasm as the first Christians. In conclusion, I repeat the expressions of the Apostle Paul that we have heard today. I thank God for all of you, and I assure you that I remember you in my prayers, in remembrance of your work in the faith, of your work in charity, and your constant hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Virgin Mary, who was not afraid to say yes to the word of the Lord, and after having conceived him in the womb, put herself on the path full of joy and hope, always be your model and guide. Learn from the Mother of the Lord and our Mother to be humble and at the same time courageous, simple and prudent, meek and strong. After Mass, he repeated the good news of the coming year of faith to the 40,000 faithful gathered in the square. He also left the English speakers with this greeting. Jesus reminds us into this gospel that over and above our duties to one another and the civil authorities, we have obligations to Almighty God. We pray for the wisdom always to recognize where our duty lies and in all things to give due praise and honor to our Creator and Redeemer. May God bless all of you. The beautiful town of Assisi will be the destination of a Pope Benedict-led pilgrimage for peace on October the 27th. The occasion, which will draw leaders of world religions and also atheists, celebrates the 25th anniversary of another so-called peace summit called by John Paul II in 1986. While some criticised the original meeting for appearing to blend all religions into one, this cardinal in charge of the Vatican Department for Justice of Peace said that this time it will not be an issue. The, the, the novelty in this celebration is the fact that the emphasis, is no, it's, the emphasis, I think, is no more on going there to pray for peace, but the emphasis is on uh, the pilgrimage and uh, the movement towards peace. And uh, as a movement towards peace, it's like bring on board all the endowments, all, all, what, all what we can you know, make use of to attain peace. And then secondly, when this is the case, it's not only the religious. Okay, so that would be the people of faith coming from the, you know, with the different endowments of their faith you know, uh, to celebrate this, but also reason, 
those out there in the world who do not you know, practice any faith or whatever, they also can contribute and have a part in this pilgrimage. So that's the big thing that we look, look forward to celebrating. So the one-day visit will consist of an initial meeting here at the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli, there the 1986 encounter and another that followed in 2002 will be remembered. Then after lunch, individuals will have time for reflection or prayer in private before making a pilgrimage together to the Basilica of St Francis. At that point, the Pope will lead participants in renewing their commitment to peace in the world. Care has been taken though not to give the wrong impression. Uh, it's not going to draw the same amount of criticism as the, you know, the other time. You know, with the emphasis on pilgrimage instead of the, you know, praying together there for peace. To get things started off well for Catholic participants at St Peter's Square the day before the pilgrimage, Pope Benedict XVI will lead a prayer vigil at the general audience.